Okay, hello, uh, good evening, day or morning, wherever you are. Uh, and thank you for joining us today, 2019 MPLUS Design Trust Research Fellowship Public Talk Part 2 with Yasmin Triariani. My name is Iko Yokoyama, Lead Curator for Design Architecture at MPLUS. So MPLUS is soon to be Open Museum of Visual Culture in Hong Kong, which we started to build the building and the collection since 2012. As early stage of institutional development, the Design Trust gave us an interest and the generous supporting to fund this fellowship program, which brought indispensable enhancement of Kyoto research to the subject, as well as able to build a wide range of network of scholars and practitioners looking in this region. 2019's fellowship is our fifth round, and we are glad that Design Trust is willing to support the research area go beyond not only Hong Kong, and Greater Bay Area, which Yasmin is the first awarded fellow looking into unique architecture typology of Indonesia, which you will be hearing very soon. Together with our last week's great presentation and discussion by Oliver Esler on Bluetooth building in Hong Kong, this year's fellow made a tremendous contribution to our curatorial research. Thank you both Oliver and Yasmin. And also today's discussion will be moderated by our curator Shirley Surya, and this event is posted by her together with the curatorial assistant Noel Chung's hard work. Thank you both. And I would like to express our sincere thanks to Design Trust again, which led by visionary co-founder and executive director Marisa Yu, supported by fantastic board and council members. Your long-term support is truly valuable for M+. Without the further ado, I hand over to Shirley. Hello, good evening all. I'm Shirley, a creator for Design and Architecture at M+. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I just wanted to be uh, playing the role of introducing all three parties who are involved in tonight's event. And so beginning with Yasmin, uh, as uh, Eco had mentioned already, uh, Yasmin's background is actually in interior design, but not only is she a designer, she's very much interested in uh, visual storytelling for the wider audience, as you will see in her presentation tonight. And before she did this uh, fellowship, she pursued her master's in design curating and writing from Design Academy Eindhoven. And over there, she graduated cum laude and her project mapping the way home, the role of architecture in constructing contested notions of identity in Indonesia was nominated the He's Baka Award. And so that project was actually what she was building on for this research. And I think I just, uh, as Iko had already mentioned, uh, it's the first time that we are awarding someone who is researching beyond Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area uh, into other parts of Asia, which very much reflect the remit of M plus and also our curatorial interest. But most importantly, I just wanted to share that we think uh, Yasmin's research on engaging with tradition in architectural production is really a perennial issue in this part of the world. Perhaps not in a very highly urbanized setting like Hong Kong, but in many countries in Asia, everything from Indonesia, China, Japan, or even Sri Lanka, where there are time-tested traditions of building, as well as the existence of indigenous and vernacular architecture, the question of how productively we engage with the issues of architectural precedence have continued to be a source of controversy, a challenge, but also a new way of finding new knowledge in relation to our identity, but also our relationship with the environment. And so we're very pleased tonight that apart from Yasmin, we have uh, two very uh, influential architects from Indonesia. So Denny Wajaksono from Jakarta and Eko Prawoto uh, from Yogyakarta uh, to help us to really consider the specificity uh, of the context in which Yasmin is looking into. And we believe that uh, Dani and Pa Eko will provide the necessary reflection as well as relevant feedback on her research. So just a few points on Dani and Pa Eko. Uh, Dani is both an architect, but also a curator. Uh, a very important person in the contemporary design scene in, in uh, Indonesia. And he has been a curator for numerous exhibitions, including the Indonesian Pavilion at the London Design Biennale, as well as the recent retrospective of Andre Martin, the architect in Indonesia. He's also a critic, a member of the International Committee for, Ex uh, for Architectural Critics, as well as the technical reviewer of the Aga Khan Awards for Architecture. And we really look forward to Danny's uh, reflection as a discussant. Uh, from his perspective as one of being uh, as being one of the young generation of architects in Indonesia and someone who's also very much involved in a very global discourse of architecture. As for Pa Eko, he's both an architect, uh, but also an educator. Uh, he's founder of Eko Prawoto Architecture Workshop, but also a lecturer at the Faculty of Architecture and Design at the Universitas Kristen Duta Wanchana in Jogja 
and uh, uh, plus has had the privilege to invite him to take part in our events in 2017 called Reorient. And, and, and one thing very important about Fire Echoes project is that it's really very much characterized by a sense of communality, craftsmanship and social activism and in which he tries to really enhance uh, locality as part of a, a kind of a strategy to integrate architecture into its context. So we'll invite Paeko to share his perspective, not only as one of the case studies that Yasmin is looking into, but also as one who had witnessed how tradition has been understood and exercised by architects across uh, the decades. And so without further ado, uh, I'll invite Yasmin and also uh, a note to the audience while you're listening to Yasmin's presentation, please feel free to feel, uh, to enter your questions in the chat box. It's a Q&A box if you were to notice it in your screen, uh, and then we will address the questions uh, later on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Iko and Shirley. Well, hi, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the M Plus Museum and Design Trust Hong Kong for giving me this precious opportunity. And I would also like to thank all of you who are here today on this virtual talk for taking time to join us. When I applied for this research fellowship back in 2018, I had just graduated from a master's program at the Design Academy Eindhoven with a thesis focusing on the architecture of identity. In that work, I examined the integration of traditional architecture within government funded buildings in Indonesia, particularly those buildings facing an international borders. The main question I posed was whose identity is our architecture really displaying to the outside world? Let me show you what I mean. Here are the seven cross-border posts in Indonesia built between 2016 until 2017. You can see the integration of elements belonging to traditional architecture and even a traditional weapon to showcase the face of Indonesia. However, these elements are only used to represent the dominant ethnicity in each area. In a country made up of around 1,300 ethnic groups spread throughout 34 provinces, such a strategy might lead to an unintended consequence, the marginalization of minorities. And this is where my current research comes in. This time I observe more inclusive strategies aimed at integrating Indonesia's architectural traditions in contemporary architecture. I took two things into account. To what extent the integration of Indonesia's architectural traditions in these chosen case studies could promote inclusivity? And what are the forces that shape the architect strategies? I started off this research by looking at the buildings of four cultural and educational institutions built by Indonesian architects in the past 10 years that even though inspired by Indonesia's architectural traditions, do not show conspicuous elements of traditional architecture. These case studies cover different geographical areas. They range from Sumatra to Kalimantan, Sulawesi and Java, representing diverse architectural traditions. Apart from relying on architecture, architectural theories, studying image of buildings and interviewing the architects, I engage in field observation for most of the case studies. By being an observant, this helps reveal how the architects intend to manifest traditional values in the specific case studies, especially those that are not as noticeable as the traditional roofs in concrete box buildings. It also shows how significant they are in current architectural practices and how they are appropriated by the architects in order to be timely. In this presentation, I classified my findings into three parts, form, technological sophistication and the intangibles. But before we are heading to the case studies, let me show you how traditional architecture has been instrumentalized in Indonesia over time. For example, this is the beautiful Indonesia Miniature Park, a tourist attraction built between 1972 until 1975 in Jakarta. It was initiated by the wife of Suharto, the second president of Indonesia. The separatist movements and the political turbulence at the end of the administration of the country's first president Sukarno gave way to the emergence of traditional architecture during Suharto's presidency. The park displays several representative traditions belonging to each Indonesian province, including the traditional architecture of dominant ethnic groups. This was meant to legitimize the scope of Indonesia's jurisdiction, which can be seen as a response to the separatist movements. Now take a look at the Dutch East Indy Pavilion 
in the 1931 colonial exposition in Paris. Traditional houses were dismantled from their original locations and reassembled or staged in the exhibition, while a traditional roof was used to accessorize the building in order to represent the territory that belonged to the metropole. Suharto's presidency replicated the Dutch colonial strategy in marking national territory and maintaining the unity of the nation. Around that same year, some government-funded buildings across Indonesia displayed the application of gigantic traditional roofs on concrete structures, mainly as an attempt to incorporate the region's features within contemporary architecture. In the 1980s, Yusuf Biliarna Mangun Wijaya, an Indonesian architect who exercised a human-centered architectural practice, wrote a book titled Wastu Citra. He borrowed the Sanskrit word for dwelling Wastu to represent an architecture that is not only focused on functions or aesthetic, but also includes human beings, their cultures, and their relationship to nature. In the early 2000s, it inspired Joseph Riotomo, an architectural historian, to coin the term Arsitektur Nusantara, or roughly translated as archipelago architecture. He promoted the idea of making Indonesia's traditional architecture a cornerstone of contemporary architecture in the country and turning it into data resources for design, rather than referencing the production of foreign countries. Building on this idea, more and more architects take part in the exploration of Indonesia's traditional architecture. During these times, the establishment of autonomous regions contributed to many infrastructures developments. The idea of integrating a region's visual features was still dominated by the practice of crowning government-funded buildings with a traditional roof. That in turn references what took place at the beautiful Indonesia in Miniature Park. The launch of Rumah Asu, an organization that collects funds to help with the conservation of traditional architecture in Indonesia by Yori Antar in 2008, brought awareness to the country's overlooked traditional architecture, which is on the verge of extinction. Take the case of the Wairabo village in East Nusa Tenggara, which is famous for its seven conical houses. When Antar and his team arrived there, three of the houses had suffered severe damage throughout the years. Rumah Asu program encouraged the villagers to rebuild their dilapidated houses based on their inherited knowledge and their memories, using materials as close to the originals as possible. This process reawakened the almost forgotten building traditions. It also revealed the function behind many architectural elements in the houses and thus proved that a banal replication will only create an out-of-context architecture. Rumah Asu is now empowering traditional communities in retaining their building know-how and expanding architectural knowledge rooted in Indonesia. Although the long-term impact of turning villages into tourist attraction might still be scrutinized, many Rumah Asu projects have kick-started a new wave of appreciation from Indonesian architects toward Indonesia's diverse cultural heritage. This program also opens an opportunity for architecture students to follow and record the building process. They weren't allowed to instruct or direct the villagers based on the theories they learned at university. They were the ones who were encouraged to learn from the villagers. By involving architecture students, Ruma Asu passed knowledge to the next generation of architects in order that they would, help, would have a better understanding of Indonesia's building traditions. Visiting Wairabo has led me to research about the integration of architectural tradition in the last 10 years contemporary architecture in Indonesia. It has been a significant period in which to observe the development of contemporary architecture in Indonesia. More and more architects who own private practices have taken part in public and private owned projects where they have been expected to integrate Indonesia's architectural traditions into building designs. But here is something interesting. Since 2009, the Indonesian government has faced many acts of growing in religious intolerance spurred by radical groups. As mentioned in a report from Human Rights Watch in 2013, ethnicity is also an important factor and remains closely intertwined with religion. Different ethnic groups practice different religions. This has created a shared awareness of the importance of reinstating Indonesia's five principles the Pancasila national ideology that promotes unity in diversity. So, the chosen case studies for this research are precisely the ones that identify the turning point in the architect's practices. 
It focuses on how they alter a particular method or theme that they have used throughout their career, then delves into the notion of traditional architecture and later pinpoint strategies that hadn't been seen in their previous work. And those are, in this case, the ones that champion inclusivity. Let's dive in into the first part, form. Integrating traditional architecture in contemporary Indonesia has mostly been limited to the replication of roofs and forms. In government funded projects, architects are likely encouraged to make a visual representation derived from traditional architecture for a political reason. This part explores the emergence of a, a new architectural language in representing Indonesian architectural tradition during the last few decades and examine the approaches taken by architects in designing a contemporary building based on architectural tradition. Before going on, I think it's important to show you one case study in my previous research that shed some light on another approach to contextualizing traditional features. This is the Banyuwangi Airport in East Java. In a quick glance, it is very modern and does not show any exaggerated replication of traditional roof. But after researching about this, the architect apparently integrates local building tradition in the design. This became my starting point to observe other architectural projects that could bridge the modern and the traditional while promoting inclusivity. Now let's look at the Islamic Center in West Tulangbawang in Lampung, completed in 2017. It comprises two buildings, a cultural commun community center called Sotsat Agung and the Asobur Mosque. West Tulangbawang is a newly established district in the Lampung province, located on the island of Sumatra. It officially parted from Tulangbawang Regency and became an autonomous district in 2008. West Tulangbawang is not a tourist destination. There are no beaches or mountains, nor does it serve as a crossing area to reach other cities. Therefore, Umar Ahmad, the head of West Tulangbawang district, attempted to attract visitors by creating the first public space in West Tulangbawang, which could become a hub for cultural events and therefore an icon for the city. Thus, he invited Andra Martin, who also designed the Banyuwangi Airport. Martin's architectural works are mostly characterized by meditative long pathways heading to concrete block buildings. Many are covered with some type of ventilation apparatus, such as timber screens, locally made uh, ventilation blocks, and old windows. While these features are still apparent in the Islamic Center, Martin admitted that he took inspiration from Seeger, a traditional Lampungis nine-peak crown in the design of Sesat Agum. Martin translated the shape into zigzag stack roofs, five bigger roofs overlapping four smaller roofs. Besides the Seeger, he also drew inspiration from the stilt house in a Lampungis village. Martin designed rooms in the ground floor slightly slanted from the middle axis of the building. With the added bonus of a pond around the building, together they create a clear sight line that accentuates the visual reference to the stilt house. Even though Martin admitted that he took inspiration from traditional houses and headdresses, Sesat Agung does not conspicuously showcase those traditional references. I will show you what I mean. This is a video excerpt from my two-hour drive to West Tulangbawang from the Radin Inton to Airport in Lampung. Along the road, I noticed many houses featuring zigzag stack roofs similar to the one on Sesat Agung. This roof arrangement appears to be ubiquitous in the area. Instead of copying the nine-peak crown, the design of Sesat Agung is more likely to create a dialogue with the existing built environment. Lampung has been a transmigration program destination where people from high density regions migrate to cultivate in the low density ones. This has been taking place since the Dutch colonial government. Until now, the descendants of the early migrants still live there and reaching the area with diverse cultures. With so many migration happening in Indonesia, any blatant imitation of certain dominant tradi traditions in institutional buildings to represent identity can be deemed irrelevant. Moving on to the next case studies. This part will present the way architects could use traditional values and elements in practical ways. They offer a combination of applying advanced technology and being resource sensitive. Let's look at the seven story Pinisi Tower of the Makassar State University in South Sulawesi, completed in 2013. In 2008, the university held an architecture competition to find the best design for a new academic center. Singh and his team at Studio Akanoma won the competition. 
Singh drew inspiration from the philosophy in the Makassar traditional house, the Finnissy sailboat and the logo of the Makassar State University. He mimics the style, the sail of Finnissy ship in the facet using hyperbolic paraboloid systems. Singh translated the tripartite elements in traditional Makassar house. The tower represents the head, the podium stands in for the body, and the pilot is work as the feet. However, this does not seem to be the case, since many high-rise buildings worldwide have also been using this tripartite formula. But if we look at the head of both the Makassar traditional house and using tower, we can see how traditional technology can be implemented into a contemporary high-rise building. In the east and west facades, Singh designed an outer structure made of multifaceted wavy enamel plates that form louvers to block heat and rainwater, while still giving way for air breeze to go inside the building. To optimize the cross ventilation and natural lighting in the tower, its floor is equipped with operational glass windows on the inner facets around the building. This configuration resembles the timpalaje, the stack heave on the of the gable of the traditional Makassar house. Besides speaking of the status of its owner, the timpalaje allows for airflow through the area below the roof. Since strategies by creating facets that could overcome the tropical climate can be traced back to the 1980s. This is the Wisma Dharmala Sakti in Jakarta, designed by Paul Rudolph. Rudolf was famous for his distinctive structural works, which are evident in his rotated geometry high-rise buildings. This technological, technological advancement is also apparent in Wisma Dharmala Sakti. Rudolf rotating the floor plans resulted in the creation of terraces shaded by the deep canted overhangs from the floor plate rotation. The overhanging roofs which protect the offices from direct sunlight are a common feature in houses in Jakarta urban village. At that time, Despite the criticism of using air conditioner in a building that responds to tropical climate, the design of Wisma Dharmala Sakti brought to light a distinctive approach in creating a high-rise building in local context. Now, PDC Tower resonates the same, in, the same strategy of overcoming tropical climate. However, in this building, Singh encouraged the application of passive ventilation. Though the application of it still needs to be analyzed, this case study suggests that the combination of traditional references and advanced technology makes it possible to avoid a superficial way to bring tradition into contemporary production. Now let's take a look at another case study. This is the Alpha Omega School in Banten, which is completed in 2017. This Christian public school is located in the suburb Tangerang, West Java, and is surrounded by the Muslim majority community. It sits on an area that once was a paddy field submerged in one meter of water. The owner of the Alpha Omega School wanted to create a nature-based school that displayed its Indonesianness, and this all came with budget and time constraints. The site, which is surrounded by Kampung and Amadi area, was soon easily reachable with heavy machinery. Inspired by traditional solutions, Real Red Sharif, the architects assigned for this project, work collectively with local craftsmen using local materials and experimenting with the structural parts. It took 40 craftsmen specialized in bamboo, steel, and mensory work and around five months to complete the construction. To fit with the school concept, Sharif chose bamboo for most of the building parts. These relatively inexpensive materials are available, are available nearby and have a fast growth cycle that sits well with the nature-friendly theme. Sharif also derived a typical stilt structure looking to traditional houses as, in, as inspiration in order to avoid the costly cut and fill of the swampy paddy field, as well as keeping the rainwater collection area below the building. Another significant part of keeping the low budget maintenance of the school complex in the long term is its passive design. Below the wavy roof of Nipalips are classrooms with half open wall and high ceilings an arrangement that contributes to passive cooling and lighting systems. As protection from the weather, Sheriff created an extended ridge roof with white overhangs on the sides to shelter the two meter corridors around the classrooms. Whereas a traditional steel house has gaps between its wooden plank flooring that allows air circulation, Sheriff achieved this by experimenting with the wall design. This is wavy, this wavy bricks this is wavy bricks walls around on the first floor. 
The wavy shape keeps the structure sturdy without any supporting columns, while the bridge of gaps in the concave area protects the inside from rainwaters and allow cross ventilation. These natural, natural cleaning systems reduce the long term electricity cost in the building complex. In the Alpha Omega School, embracing traditional values by working with craftsmen resulted in an increased engagement with the local community. Also, by rooting it in building traditions, this design champions inclusivity in a way that transcends the diverse ethnic groups and the religious environment. This brings us to the last part. In most of Indonesia's building tradition before the existence of European architectural education, which was brought by Dutch colonialization, Builders were prominent in construction. Traditional architecture in Indonesia is usually built collectively by the community and is labor intensive. As advanced technology and machinery arrive, the traditional craftsmanship and collective work or gotong royong seems to be less appreciated. Human labor was thus placed at the bottom of the pyramid, with workers treated as a machines to perform as instructed to them. This was what the next case studies actually paid attention to, the people behind the building tradition. Let's begin by looking at Wisma Kuera, the house of the lead architect Mangun Wijaya, which he started to build in 1986 in Yogyakarta. In this house, we can see doors, ceilings, and floorings made from bamboo screens, curved wooden windows, and wall coverings made of what looks like leftover roof tiles put into a wall. These are materials that clearly do not come from mass production. They were either crafted or made out of waste materials. Mangun Wijaya spent most of his construction budget on the craftsmen who worked with him, and he highly appreciated the building materials used. Mangun Wijaya's human center approaches have inspired Eko Prawoto and Yossi Fajar, the Yogyakarta-based architects. The two of them manifested Indonesia's architectural traditions, both in the design and the construction process, where they fight for environmental sustainability and against the marginalization of human labor. They were included to provide a different perspective. You can sample this in the Chamati Art House in Yogyakarta, designed by Eko Prawoto in 1997 until 1999. We can see a second-hand Japanese house called Limasan, used here to connect the outside with the exhibition, exhibition space and other private areas. At the time Prawoto helped with the design, Chimati shifted from being a gallery to an art house. Prawoto responded this by using the Limasan to create the house atmosphere. While a Limasan usually low in height, Prawoto lifted the structure by placing additional pedestal on the existing main pillars. This additional height allowed the visual transparency that connects the outside with the exhibition space. Looking in detail at the structure of the Limasan, we can see the notches and paint stains from their previous uses. A mosaic of shattered yellow tiles, which seems to come from the leftover cut tiles of the house's floorings, adorn the sink backsplash. These examples help show Prawoto's appreciation towards building materials and demonstrate how he used a traditional feature of a Japanese house that conformed with the function needed in his project. In 2006, Prawoto helped the earthquake victims in the Nibikan village, the hometown of Mariono, the foreman who usually worked with him. Instead of directing the whole rebuilding process, Prawoto chose to provide only the basic design of a house. This is one of Prawoto's alternative house design. The Japanese kampung style houses inspired him to create an expandable plan. The design is open for appropriation and is based on every household needs. Together with Mariono, he decided to create a ductile structure that combines reinforced concrete and wooden beams to provide seismic safety in the earthquake prone area. In these case studies, integrating tradition wasn't only about architectural design. At the time, Mariono was the only village villager, uh, village resident adept at construction, but he then taught and encouraged the other villagers to collectively rebuild the houses rather than wait for the outside help. This type of communal work is a tradition in many villages in Indonesia. Implementing architectural tradition, therefore, is not just a matter of a building themselves. It's about sharing knowledge and educating others so that customs can be continued. In August 2019, I visited the Nibikan village. Some houses showed a form of, of expansion. 
to add more space, the villagers had replicated the base unit of their houses or they had just prolonged the eaves and erected walls on the area below it. While this basic design made it easier for a communal work scheme, Prawoto's plan left space for each resident to use materials from their house's debris. Thus, each home is allowed to showcase its uniqueness. Still in Yogyakarta, Fajar also applied the communal work system to his architectural practices, which he called Ugahari, which is related to permaculture. Residential projects dominate Fajar's work. He carefully selects his clients since he has a specific way of practicing architecture. He expects his client to come to the site regularly and join the discussion with craftsmen and the architect in charge. The owner must be fully involved in every stage of construction by co-sourcing secondhand materials for the projects. This, for example, is Asrita House, one of Fajar's ongoing projects. I visited it in 2019 and I met Gayu, the architect in charge, Prianto, the project foreman, and Asita Kaladewa, the homeowner. They had a discussion next to a pile of secondhand windows, doors, and wood before continuing with the architectural drawing. They determined the parts of the house that would fit the measurements of the reclaimed materials. Apart from treating the surface, they rarely modified the secondhand materials. When they didn't find ones that fit, they would contact the other Ugahari clients in order, in order to help each other. This way, as the Ugahari network becomes more extensive, collective work also takes place across projects. Most importantly, this promotes equality and humanization towards the craftsmen by treating them as design partners. Throughout these few case studies, we have seen the shift from a top-down approach by the government to an increasing bottom-up approach initiated by architects who are integrating traditional values. This bottom-up approach has brought up a noticeable difference in the absence of the conspicuous elements of traditional houses. It shapes a new way of understanding the implementation of Indonesia's building tradition. Some of these case studies have even garnered government acceptance of the architect's strategies. In the end, the chosen architectural projects have shown that by integrating traditional values, practicing architecture can be a way to develop a more inclusive architectural practice that embraces the cultural diversities in Indonesian archipelago to minimize energy usage and waste and to fight the marginalization of human labor. They also show that being rooted in tradition doesn't mean disregarding architectural knowledge from other parts of the world or shunning the use of the latest technologies. This is because architecture is not about the building alone. It's also about the human beings, the culture, the environment, and the connection between them. In this homogeneous global world, rooting tradition and construction in tradition, traditions produces architectural works that can always be true to their context, that are in dialogue with their surroundings, and also create a sense of familiarity and belonging within their com community. The situation these communities experience can be found not only in Indonesia, but also in many countries throughout Asia and around the world. Therefore, by changing the many ways we design locally, we can change the way we design globally. Thank you. I'm going to say congratulations, Yasmin, for a conclusion that really kind of expands beyond um, what we are considering about the context of Indonesia, but even a more universal question about how do we engage a kind of a continuity with the issue of tradition uh, beyond form, but something that actually able to relate to humanity and a greater environment. So we just want to thank you for, for that. And right now, I'm just going to hand it over to Danny to share your, your views as uh, yeah. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Shirley, for the for for the kind introduction, and also uh, thank you, M Plus Museum, for inviting me. It's a uh, it's a uh, nice feeling, and also an honor to be to be invited and speak in this in this uh, event. Uh, first of all, congratulations to Yasmin on your research and uh, the wonderful presentation. Uh, the three points that you brought up is is a really good three points to help understand. Um, the relationships between traditional architecture and modern architecture that uh, has has, hap has happened today in contemporary Indonesian architecture. Also, I think um, this is a really a perfect time to brought uh, this topic into light because um, this is uh, we, we are now in a time where we need to rethink 
about the type of architecture that we are making and also uh, the nature and the purpose of, of our profession in the contemporary world. Um, I think my first reaction to Yasmin research would be to raise the importance of understanding traditional architecture, not just as a way to create a certain image of architectural identity, but uh, also one that goes deeper and more fundamentals uh, than that. Uh, you know, the, uh, the different ways of how materials uh, can be manipulated, how joints can be created, uh, spaces can be arranged, and um, also how climate can be celebrated and how the person with all that knowledge of, of traditional making um, architecture can serve their community. Uh, that, that is another uh, aspect that I think we can look at traditional architecture. Um, at the moment, this, this understanding, I, I think it's not really deep in, in Indonesia. Um, maybe this is due to the change in the way of uh, Indonesians live uh, uh, after the, the nation Indonesia was born. Uh, there was a changing in, in the way of, of people uh, uh, live uh, at, at that time. Um, and also, as, as Yasmin has mentioned, there are so many traditions in making architecture in Indonesia, but uh, at a certain point, uh, we seem to be disconnected from it. After that uh, disconnection, we are making architecture and creating living environment without any evidence uh, effort to evolve these many traditions to suit our contemporary way of life. I think achieving this deep level understanding is very important because so many knowledge that has been produced by the makers of this type of architecture that we can learn from, knowledge that we perhaps can use to create a better architecture and a better living environment uh, today. But how to achieve this deeper uh, understanding? I think one of the way would be uh, to look at a different type of uh, architectural history narrative. A narrative uh, that tells not only about uh, the styles of architecture that has been produced by modern architects, but also one that tells about the development of knowledge in traditional ways of making buildings and the history of changing conditions that led to the making of it. In Indonesia today, there are many practicing architects know and learn less about how Indonesians traditionally make architecture and they know more about what style has been changing in the design world and how different architects designs and work. This I think is not wrong. I just think it's not, not complete yet. I think we need to look at a more complete narrative of how architecture has developed and changed over the years. Um, one narrative that, that tells about the changes in how humans make architecture and not solely about how architects make architecture. I, I, I really believe there is that there is abundant of knowledge uh, about how to make good architecture if we really wanted to understand uh, the traditional ways of, of making architecture. I think that will be my my uh, my comment and my reaction to Yasmin's research. Congratulations, Yasmin, once again. Yeah, thank you, Danny, for your thoughts. And so I guess uh, the question of how this actually provoke the need for, I guess, the, the kind of like a deeper understanding of what traditional architecture is in terms of its methods, you know, like its craftsmanship, its skill set that could possibly be integrated into practice. That's one. And then the other one that you mentioned is about the importance of actually narrating or even documenting or even kind of like how do we even study it, right, as part of a greater uh, training of architectural education and all that. So I think I think, yeah, I think uh, your research definitely had raised some of these because I think from Danny, you mentioned that we don't necessarily study traditional architecture in the curriculum when you're in school in the way that Yasmin is actually studying these buildings. And so I think there's plenty of uh, of scope there in which we can actually bring in these things that you have researched on as, as part of uh, as part of education itself. And I'm sure your Antara's project with Ruma Asu, which I'm sure all of you have been part of before, uh, would resonate with that. So Danny, just I wanted to ask, you know, if you have any, perhaps any critique of uh, Yasmin's um, research, uh, you know, or like any other question that you think she could have gone further into. Yeah, I think uh, I'm, I'm very intrigued with the three points that Yasmin uh, proposes and how to look at the uh, relationship between traditional architecture and modern architecture. But I also believe that uh, I think it's 
it could be more than just three. You know, if if there are to be more than just three points, if there are a four point on how to look at the connection between traditional architecture and modern architecture, what what do you think would it be? All right, thank you, Masini. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting question to look at. But for me, I don't know uh, the specific term yet, but for me, it will be built upon the idea of the intangibles, because I think when you go deeper to the intangibles part, then you will see um, many, many ways. It's not only about the communal work. It's not only about um, the uh, permaculture ways, but then there are many things in traditional architecture that are intangibles and actually can be manifested to our uh, contemporary architecture and i think uh, by understanding that it's 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 really need a more uh, research on that but i think it is the most important part like if we talk about the form and the top technological sophistication it could also it could also come from this intangible this uh, this way of thinking about building traditions so it doesn't necessarily necessarily has to be something that is uh, you can see first or you can touch like the form or the technology, but then it could be starting from the the concept or or the the way you producing architecture, and I think uh, more and more we should look at uh, how different it is when you see these intangible parts with the form and. Uh, with the technological sophistication in terms of how long they created this design. Like the time, they, they're really taking time in creating the design. So it's not about um, creating a lot of, uh, like, how do you say that? For me, it's architecture will leave a long trace. So if you just take time and to see in a long term, what would this architecture be and how it will create a social interaction between people around around it. So I think it will be built upon the intangible parts, but I haven't really um, really narrow it down or to have like one um, category to express it, but I think it will be more in that direction. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Yasmin, so I'm going to also give an uh, opportunity for Pa Echo. You know, I think as we mentioned, uh, he's going to be representing uh, our witness to history since the 80s and how this idea of tradition is being used by architects in Indonesia. And so, yeah, please, Pa Echo, uh, share your thoughts with us. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to M Plus for inviting me to be part of this discussion uh, concerning the important research, I think, uh, done by Yasmin, and it's really refreshed or even giving us a new horizon in in architecture thought. I think uh, talking about tradition in architecture is always interesting. It's it's a kind of love hate relationship. I think uh, sometimes we we want to. Uh, to feel that tradition is become a, a burden because we only inherit something that we have to carry it in, in our life and we want to get rid of it. And we want to have more freedom. But actually it is, uh, we cannot. It's not only because such freedom is, is, is not possible, but it's also because uh, we cannot make anything of uh, without uh, raw materials. And I believe that our tradition is one of the raw materials. Uh, we cannot make anything without anything. So nothing from nothing. So we have to have us something to begin with. And I believe this is the, the tradition. And as a practitioner, uh, I think that, um, well, I've been through this all dynamic uh, th through time. 
and the dialogue or the the the, the intertwining thought between tradition and modernity is uh, is like a uh, always happening it's it's we are living in the, the in the tension of those two poles as forces but also as sources in our uh, creative work i think and i would like to mention about uh, two notes i think the first the swing of the attitude it's never never constant i mean the it's like a pendulum uh, movement so one time we are very close to the tradition and other time we are become like obsessed with the modern uh, modernity and we want to get rid of the tradition and we want to become uh, anti modern uh, anti tradition but basically this is the the we move in between uh, that poles i think and we try to to find the the right balance and it's very much depend on 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 the context on the discourses and the situation which is uh, happening it's really a dynamic situation and and architecture is always live in in this two contestation i think um and the second what to be picked up from we have to learn we have to to know uh, the situation and archi uh, doing architecture is also part of the learning process we are not uh, doing in a in a empty space or in vacuum so we have to learn from either from from uh, our traditions or also from uh, uh, any other architectural practice i think and it's again it's also move sometimes it's very attached or close to the notion of form and sometimes uh, more abstract it's more related with a, a symbolic meaning for instance and sometimes it uh, go back again to more uh, the values behind so instead of physical thing it's more about the intrinsic values behind uh, and sometimes it's strengthened again we we talk more about the cultural identity for instance so again it's about uh, physical things again and sometimes we we also want to protect uh, our own identity but at the same time we want to also to share about uh, the knowledge behind the technical things the way we learn from the tradition how uh, to to deal with or to to overcome uh, or to in line with the uh, with the surrounding nature and climate and also there are many other aspects such as uh, the knowledge about uh, uh, materials organic materials we have uh, plenty of it and in, in, in the sense of uh, technique, uh, detailing, or in how to handle that, that kind of materials, for instance. And, and also, uh, if we think more the relevance about the wider context, tradition could be inspiration, how we could learn again, how to live in harmony with the nature, or even, it, it sometimes uh, becoming very, very uh, spiritual because it gives us the, the, the different role. It, uh, our relationship, for instance, with the nature is not only extracting or, or taking from, from the nature, but from the traditional people, we, we could learn that we supposed to be the guardian of the environment as well. So it's a wide range of uh, of knowledge that we should uh, look at 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 the, the 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 space between uh, tradition and modernity. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.
Thank you, um, thank you, Paiko. I just wanted to uh, uh, get, uh, give attention to the three very uh, thoughtful questions that came in. Um, of course, we could say more and ask uh, uh, Paiko and Danny to reflect further, but just going on to a question that I had, but also related to a question that just came up here. I just go by time. The first question that came up was the question about how do architects manage to convince their clients, including the government, about how tradition is so much more than the appearance of a building, but it's actually something to do with the intangible part of, of, of traditional architecture, you know, especially when it's very hard for the eyes to see. So how is this convincing process? So that's a great question because I was also going to ask by Echo or even Danny and your knowledge of uh, practices in Indonesia. Is what is what um, Yasmin bringing up as completely naive and ideal, you know, because she's like looking at it as an observer, not necessarily in the process of knowing how the clients and the architects actually discuss and decide on these things. So yeah, uh, anyone wants to address that question about how do you engage the client to see tradition as more than just a very obvious formal thing? It's for Yasmin or for who? Uh, okay, so I, I'm going to pick this because you cannot decide. <laughs> I'll, just go, uh, I'll just go with Paiko first. Is that okay? We'll let okay. our elders. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, our, I would say something like uh, our knowledge about our experience about modernity is still very, very short. It's only a few hundred years back. But the knowledge about the tradition is much, much longer. So I believe that if something can survive in the long uh, term of time, 100 years or maybe 1,000 years, it must be a quality uh, embedded inside. Then we have to discover it. Because uh, its source of learning it's it's very important. Architecture is about knowledge. It's about knowledge about the material, how to deal with the climate, how to deal with uh, the uh, different kind of materials and and also the jointing technique and everything. It's so varied, and we have to have uh, uh, we have to learn. I think, and the the I think the closest. Uh, accessible uh, source of learning is our tradition. OK, but Danny is accidentally cut off, uh, but let's see. But Echo, uh, we want to ask, uh, you brought up some, you know, kind of like idea about like what it means to learn. But can I just ask you again, uh, the question that came in from the Q&A is like, how do you how do you convince the clients to think like this? That tradition, you know, when you have a project, that tradition is really more than the form. So have you dealt with that? Like, you know, like, um, so yeah, especially with the clients that you have, you have kind of uh, come across. Yeah, but first we don't, ha we don't have to think that tradition is something uh, behind and it's in a remote time, I think. But tradition is about a compilation of knowledge and solution and, and, and strategy, for instance. Okay. So, as far as we know our problem, our architectural problem or design problem, then tradition will be our close uh, uh, references. So it's easy to connect. So we, right. we don't connect or we use our tradition only in the sense of nostalgic or romanticism, but it's just to provide or to find the, uh, the proof and solution for mm. a certain problem. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yasmin, do you have your thoughts on that? Because you may have been interviewing these architects and what did they tell you about this process? Yeah. OK, actually, it's very interesting if we look at the um, the first classification, which is form. Um, if you if, if we look at that, the architects um, saying that they actually uh, integrate the shape, uh, the, the, the traditional houses of like for example Banyuwangi uh, Andra Martin is uh, inspired by uh, the Austin traditional house and then on the Sesat Agung it's inspired by the Seeger but then it's actually I think the way to uh, approach the government I think so <laughs> from what I'm seeing throughout the case studies like saying that you integrate uh, this kind of uh, traditions uh, which is can be seen which is uh, which you can really 
see, okay, this is the, the Osing traditional house and this will be the source of inspiration. This is the Seeger, this will be the source of, of inspiration. But then when you really work on the uh, on the design, the architects are usually tweak it. So the architectural works do not really show the conspicuous elements, do not show the replication or imitation of that certain reference. So I think it's the matter of uh, communicating your idea to the government, like making them very convinced that this is the, uh, the this have a traditional uh, architecture reverence, but then you can move on from that and then create something like built upon the idea of the traditional houses, but you cannot, uh, you, you, you might not um, having a, an architectural works that replicated what your reference is. So I think it's more likely like that, like the communication thing with the government is important. Mm. Thank you. So I just wanted to uh, bring up the second question, which is kind of similar because the second question is about perception. Uh, the question of perception and how these buildings have been uh, um, kind of like seen by the public, uh, right? So, which is the client? The client would be considered the public as well. Um, and so, how do you? Yeah. So, there was a question. Uh, how can you share more on how these things were perceived by the local audience? Um, and did they also pick up on the subtle reference that are revealed through your research? Yasmin. Yeah. Do you yeah. hear my, my question? <laughs> I, yeah, I asked you it's just breaking up a bit, but then I hear it. Okay. Right. Um, it's interesting because uh, when I went to several places and I asked the people, like, do, do you think it, uh, what do you think it looks like, like in Sasat Agung, for example, uh, what do you think it looks like? Because it's a cultural hall, right? So uh, the the person that I just met in uh, in West Tulang Bawang told me that, okay, uh, it's actually, I think it is, it looks like um, Lampung traditional houses. It's raised on stilts. So it is, it must be a traditional house from our area. And I was, okay, so what do you think the, the roof uh, is actually referenced to? Because I have seen the traditional architecture of uh, West Tulang Bawang and Lampung, and it's not like that. But the people around Sasat Agung were like, Oh, um, no, we thought it's just um, it's because of the stilt structure. So it looks like what our ancestors were having back then. So I think it's actually they, they are being influenced by what the the media or the government saying to them. They kind of believe it like it's it's just like the beautiful Indonesia in miniature park, if I may say, like when the government said uh, one particular architecture is associated with one uh, place then or one province, then you started to believe it for a long time. Like you, you don't really uh, think about it, but then when you look at in this uh, precise province, they have so many different culture happening there. But then when the government said, uh, okay, this is um, actually the traditional architecture that rep represent this province, you started to believe it without questioning it. So I, I thought it's it's it was a very uh, interesting conversation with the locals when they said, yeah, it is the uh, the traditional house of um, West Tulang Bawang. It, it, we, we can see it because it's on stilts. Yeah, um, but I go, uh, do you have any thoughts on that about how your buildings have been perceived by Echo? <laughs> yeah. Um I don't know if we we are more familiar with form. Well, form is easy, but form itself it's not enough, I think. Um form should be justified. So we cannot use form for the sake of form for the sense of maybe Nostalgic, nostalgic or, or identity. Uh, one other thing that I think it's, it's, it's more speak to our heart is the materials. The materiality of something, it's, it's closer to our heart. Uh, we, we know it from, from our culture, from the past. It, 
we know how to deal with it. We we um, we convince with the quality. We know how to to work with it. We uh, and and also the quality which is embedded in in that material. So the knowledge about material is is important. Okay. Thank you. Danny is back. <laughs> so yeah. Sorry that sorry that your internet uh, kind of had a problem there. But I wanted to really ask you about this, this second question that we are just discussing. We already asked Yasmin, we already asked Paiko, but it's a question about how the public perceives such buildings. Um, and so, like you know, the question of like, are they able to pick up the idea of this being a traditional architecture? Um, so yeah, do you know, I mean, I guess for you as a critic, you know, as someone who writes about architecture in Indonesia, how would you see these projects that you're kind of seeing in, um, yeah, these case studies? How, what were your perception as an architect, but also what you know, what the public think about it? No, I think it's a it's a really good it's a really good effort to to continue the tradition. I mean, I, as I've mentioned in my in my explanation, um, there has been a disconnection between the tradition, how we usually traditionally make buildings, and and now. Or how the contemporary architects, contemporary Indonesian people built. Sorry, wait, a di disruption. Sorry, these things are unpredictable, but uh, yeah, so we will definitely get Danny to finish his last point. <coughs> and this is what I meant by contemporary way of Indonesian li living. <laughs> So it's 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 a really good effort uh, it, in in a way uh, to see that it's it's a good way to reconnect to our traditional ways of making buildings. You know, of course, we have many and we have different types of traditional architectures in different regions, but all these buildings that Yasmin has shown and every effort that uh, Indonesian architect has tried to make to to uh, to fuse traditional ways, whatever the aspect might be with modern architecture that they're making, is a good way to start to reconnect. Of course, about the quality, you can be critical, very critical about that, but it's it has to be a continuing effort to reconnect again to our traditional ways of making architecture, um, because there's a lot of good in there that could that could soften the bad that we are currently doing. <laughs> it's not always good what we're doing today, but there's a lot of good that the traditional architects, uh, traditional architecture uh, has, has made. So that is one of the reasons why we should do. And I think that the public, if we are to guess what the public is, is, is thinking, I think they've been waiting for this. Uh, waiting for really good quality of of uh, evolution of traditional architecture to become contemporary modern architecture, and uh, so uh, yeah, I think I think that would be that would be more my comment. Can, can, can I answer on the on, on the first question that I didn't have a chance to? Yeah, yeah sure. Did yeah, just, I so. think I think we are at nine thirty five, but we want to address one last question. But yeah, please please share your thoughts. OK, uh, uh, the, the changes in Indonesian way of making buildings and the changes in life of Indonesians has led to a different way, a different relationships and a different way of making architecture. It's also about the relationship of of our people and how architecture was made. So really, if you communicate with the government and you communicate with uh, non-government people who wanted to make architecture, there's different way, different ways to to convince them to uh, adopt traditional ways of making making buildings. But not every project is successful in in that terms. Uh, so it's really at the moment it's really more in the hard part of the profession of the practice to convince uh, government and people to ad to adopt traditional ways of making architecture but it's not impossible you just have to know who you talk to and how and what informations are you you delivering to them 
Yeah, thank you, Danny. I, I think um, uh, there is a, a concern for time at the moment. Um, I just wanted to have uh, bring up the last question, which is a very uh, meaningful one. It's about labor and uh, and of course how does uh, tend to be an exploitation or like an abuse. And so the question here is, you know, how do you actually as architects uh, dealing with issues in which you know, landowners may not be respected uh, during the land acquisition process or the question of ethics uh, in, in, like, in like big projects. Uh, how do you resolve it? And so, of course, for you, uh, Yasmin, you brought up about how the third point actually uh, avoids the marginalization of labor. But I guess, I guess generally, you know, how do we deal with this larger ethical issues when the clients may not respect, you know, ownership and, and, and labor processes and so on and so forth? Just, okay, we have to, yeah, the next few minutes, maybe. Any question, any anyone to address that issue? Um, you can, Michael will probably have to start it, I think. <laughs> uh, you talk, uh, you talk last. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it's, it's very much uh, depend on the condition of the client and also condition of the, 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 the surrounding, uh, social culture, I think. And as an architect, I think we don't make architecture out of, uh, vacuum so we have to offer a solution and and depend on the context in my case because of some of my projects are very very related with uh, my client is not uh, super rich uh, people and i'm very much concerned about the budget and also i could see that doing architecture is an opportunity also to to generate the local economy so I think it's 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 a good uh, to use that opportunity to create more jobs, and it means that to allocate the budget more to the to the human being rather than uh, using expensive materials. Thank you. Yeah. So you know we could go on and uh, talk more. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you all again for your presence, uh, Yasmin, for all your effort, and Paeko and and Danny. This issue, I hope, can be further discussed in Indonesia. I look forward to an entire conference about it. <laughs> because I think, you know, I think I think we have to acknowledge that in Hong Kong, perhaps this issue is not as pertinent, uh, but I think it's still something that M Plus would like to really engage with. Uh, we, we are interested in the issue that, that most of areas in Asia are facing, and this is definitely one issue. And we just want to thank you again for reminding us that tradition is really much more than superficiality. It's not enough. There is much more. It's much more than skin deep. It's about processes, it's about human values, and you know new ethos of relating to the environment and nature and so on and so forth so we really hope that i guess as designers we are not just looking for the form and the roof form again and again and so yeah thank you again for for this um, opportunity to discuss further and uh, and yeah look forward to more of these discourse in indonesia yeah thank you again all of you uh whoever is still there uh, for joining us as well have thank a you. nice supper <laughs> thank you okay bye bye, bye. Thank you.